Hiya three, we are going to carry on with our book Matilda. Um, just a little recap, we learnt about Matilda moving on to the adult books in the library and she'd become um, started a friendship with Mrs Phelps the librarian. During the first week of Matilda's visits, Mrs Phelps had said to her, does your mother walk you down here every day and then take you home? My mother goes to Aylesbury every afternoon to play bingo, Matilda said. She doesn't know that I come here. But that's surely not right, Mrs Phelps said. I think you'd better ask her. I'd rather not, Matilda said. She doesn't uh, encourage reading and neither does my father. But what do they expect you do every afternoon in an empty house? Just mooch around and watch the telly. I see. She doesn't really care what I do, Matilda said sadly. Mrs Phelps was a little concerned about the child's safety on the walk through the fairly busy village, High Street, and the crossing of the road, but she decided not to interfere. Within a week, Matilda had finished Great Expectations, which in that edition contained 411 pages. I loved it, she said to Mrs Phelps. Has Dickens written any others? A great number, said the astounded Mrs Phelps. Shall I choose you another one? Over the next six months, under Mrs Phelps' watchful, watchful and compassionate eye, Matilda read the following books. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens, Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Tess of the Un... Herbivilles by Thomas Hardy, Gone to Earth by Mary Webb, Kim by Rudyard Kipling, The Invisible Man by H.G. Wells, The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway, The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner, The Grapes of the Wrath by John Steinbeck, The Good Companions by J.B. Priestley, Brighton Rock by Graham Greene and Animal Farm by George Orwell. Lots of books. It was a formidable list, and by now Mrs Phelps was filled with wonder and excitement. But it was probably a good thing that she did not allow herself to be completely carried away by it all. Almost anyone else witnessing the achievements of this small child would have been tempted to make a great fuss and shout the news all over the village and beyond. But not so Mrs Phelps. She was someone who minded her own business and had long since discovered it was seldom worthwhile to interfere with other people's children. Mrs Hemingsway says lots of things I don't understand, Matilda said to her, especially about men and women. But I loved it all the same. The way he tells it, I feel I'm right there on the spot watching it all happen. A fine writer will always make you feel that, Mrs Phelps said. And don't worry about the bits that you don't understand. Sit back and allow the words to wash around you like music. I will, I will. Did you know, Mrs Phelps said, that public libraries like this allow you to borrow books and take them home? I didn't know that, Matilda said. Could I do it? Of course, Mrs Phelps said. When you have chosen the book you want to bring, that you want to take home, bring it to me and I'll make a note of it and then it's yours for two weeks. You can take more than one if you wish. From then on, Matilda would visit the library only once a week in order to take out new books and return the old ones. Her own small bedroom now became her reading room and there she would sit and read most afternoons, often with a mug of hot chocolate beside her. She was not quite tall enough to reach things around the kitchen, but she kept a small box in the outhouse which she brought in and stood on in order to get whatever she wanted. Mostly, it was hot chocolate she made, warming the milk in a saucepan above the stove before mixing it. Occasionally, she made bovril or ovaltine. It was pleasant to take a hot drink up to her room and have it beside her as she sat in silence in the empty house in the afternoons. The books transported her into new worlds and introduced her to amazing people who lived exciting lives. She went on olden day sailing ships with Joseph Conrad. She went to Africa with Ernest Hemingway and India with Rudy Kipling. She traveled all over the world while sitting in her room in a little English village. Okay, we're on to chapter two, Mr. Wormwood and the Great Car Dealer. Matilda's parents owned quite a nice house with three bedrooms upstairs. 
while on the ground floor there was a dining room and a living room and a kitchen. Her father was a dealer in second-hand cards, cars, and it seemed he did pretty well at it. Sawdust, he would say proudly, is one of the great secrets of my success. And it costs me nothing. I get it from free from the sawmill. What do you use it for? Matilda would ask him. Ha! The father would said. Wouldn't you like to know? I don't see how sawdust could help you send, sell second-hand cars, Daddy. That's because you're an ignorant, ignorant little twit, the father said. His speech was never very delicate, but Matilda was used to it. She also knew that he liked to boast, and she would egg him on shamelessly. You must be very clever to find a use for something that costs, costs nothing, she said. I wish I could do it. You couldn't, the father said. You're stupid. But I don't mind telling you that young Mike here about it. Soon, he'll be joining me in the business one day. Ignoring Matilda, he turned to his son and said, I'm always glad to buy a car when some fool has been crashing up the gears so badly that they're all worn out and rattle, and it rattles like a mat. I get it cheap. And then all I do is mix a lot of sawdust with the oil in the gearbox and it runs as sweet as a nut. How long will it run for like that before it starts rattling again? Matilda asked him. Long enough for the bite to get a good distance away, the father said, grinning. About a hundred miles. But that's dishonest, Daddy. It's cheating. No one ever got rich being honest, did they? The father said. Customers are there to be diddled. Mr Wormwood was a small, ratty-looking man whose front teeth stuck out underneath a thin, ratty moustache. He liked to wear jackets with large, brightly coloured checks, and he sported ties that were usually yellow or pale green. Now take mileage, for instance, he went on. Anyone who's buying a second-hand car, the first thing he wants to know is how many miles it's done, right? Right, the son said. So I buy an old dump that's got about 150 miles on the clock. I get it cheap. But no one's going to buy it with a mileage like that, are they? And these days you can't just take the speedometer out and fiddle the numbers back like you used to be able to do ten years ago. They fixed it so it's impossible to tamper with it unless you're a ruddy watchmaker or something. So what do I do? I use my brains, laddie, that's what I do. How? young Michael asked, fascinated. He seemed to have inherited his father's love of crockery. I sit down and I say to myself, how can I convert mileage reading to of 150,000 into only 10,000 without taking the speedometer to pieces? Well, if I were to run the car backwards for long enough, then obviously that would do it. The numbers would click backwards, wouldn't they? But who's going to drive a flaming car in reverse for thousands and thousands of miles? You couldn't do it. Of course you couldn't, young Michael said. So I scratch my head, the father said. I use my brains. When you've been given a fine brain like I have, you got used to it. And all of a sudden, the answer hits me. I tell you, I felt it exactly like that other brilliant fellow that must have felt it when he discovered penicillin. Eureka! I cried out. I've got it! What did you do, Dad? The son asked. The speedometer, Mr Wormwood said, is run off a cable that is coupled up to one of the front wheels. So first I disconnect the cable wire where it joins onto the front wheel. Next I get one of those high speed electric drills and I couple and I couple that up to the end of the cable in such a way that when the drill turns, it turns the cable backwards. You got me so far? Are you following me? Uh, yes, Daddy, young Michael said. These drills run at a tremendous speed, the father said. So when I switch on the drill, the mileage numbers on the speedo pin backwards as fast as a fast, fantastic rate. I can knock 50,000 miles off the clock in a few minutes with my high speed electric drill. And by the time I've finished, the car's only done 10,000 and it's ready for sale. She's almost new, I say to the customer. She's hardly done 10,000. Belonged to an old lady who used to have it who used it once a week for shopping. Can you really turn the mileage back with an electric drill? Michael asked. 
I'm telling you trade secrets, the father said, so you don't go talking about this to anyone else. You don't want me to put you in a drug, do you? I won't tell a soul, the boy said. Do you do this to many cars, Dad? Okay, and I'm going to stop there and carry on tomorrow. Hope you enjoyed it, year three.